Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Justin Drake of the Ethereum Foundation. Justin is a longtime Bitcoiner and also one of the key designers for the Ethereum 2.0 consensus change on top of Ethereum. In this conversation, we're talking about a potential 51% attack on the Bitcoin network. We go through the optimizations that a 51% attacker would need to undergo in order to successfully pull off an attack and ways that Bitcoin could protect itself proactively. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provide top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This essential academy course offered by Foundry will take place in Rochester, New York from June 26th through the 30th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. It will ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Justin, welcome to the Mining Pod. I am quite excited for this show. Uh, we're talking about a theoretical 51% attack on the Bitcoin network. Definitely a mining topic. Also definitely a topic we have not had on the show before, but one that I think will certainly cause a lot of controversy. Uh, but first and foremost, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Will. So just before we jump into it, uh, let's get a quick rundown on yourself for those who are not familiar. And I've been following your work for years now, so I'm fairly familiar and a big fan. Uh, but for those who are not involved intimately with what you're doing. Sure. So um, I discovered Bitcoin in 2013 uh, through a friend and I uh, started the Cambridge Bitcoin meetup group in the UK, um, kind of organized Bitcoin events. I also uh, bought a Bitcoin ATM in Cambridge. So I was uh, you know, receiving British pound notes and then sending Bitcoin to whoever wanted to, to buy it. And I did this as a public good, basically didn't really take a cut uh, for, for myself. Um, and then I started a Bitcoin company. Um, I was uh, building on top of a project called Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar was a peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin uh, marketplace um, that was meant to be you know, without intermediaries such as eBay Inc. or, or, or you know, uh, Uber or Airbnb. Um, and then my, uh, you know, my company didn't do too well and Open Bazaar didn't do too well. And I basically was interested in Ethereum because it was solving a lot of the, the, the problems of Open Bazaar because building a marketplace is difficult, right? You need all sorts of components that are very expressive. You need programmability. And that, that is what kind of naturally led me to Ethereum. And um, I saw a talk, you know, I wanted to build, I wanted to contribute. I saw a talk by, uh, by Vitalik on this, Ethereum open problem called the data availability problem. It's about scaling blockchains uh, sustainably while keeping decentralization. And I had a few ideas. I emailed him and he hired me to join the Ethereum Foundation a few weeks later. And I've been at the Ethereum Foundation for, for five years. But you know, I, I still think of myself as a Bitcoiner, at least from a sentimental standpoint. Uh, you know, I still hold one Bitcoin, you know, almost as a, a sentimental NFT. Um, and um, you know, I, I actually think that Ethereum is kind of the natural kind of continuation almost of, of, of Bitcoin. And if there's anything I can do to help improve Bitcoin, that's, that, that, that's something I'm excited about. And I think there is a lot of opportunity for improvement for Bitcoin, but it does come at a, at a, at a big cost, which is that to, you need to break ossification. Uh, but maybe breaking ossification is necessary. And that could be a topic of the discussion today. Definitely. Ossification is something that's coming around right now with a uh, whole inscriptions and ordinals debate going on. Uh, so mm. definitely a, a topic of the moment. Let's dive into what you're working on. Uh, I've seen, I don't know when it was, might have been a while ago, but you've had some work on 51% attacks. So you've had some like thoughts on them in the past. And for those who are not familiar, 51% is probably a top three, top five sort of pressures on Bitcoin or theoretical pressures on Bitcoin that could lead to the shutdown of the chain or at least a halt or downward pressure on the price of Bitcoin. Uh, and it essentially goes along the lines, I'm going to hand this over to you, Justin, that if a mining entity is able to control 51% of the hash rate, then they're able to impose certain conditions on the chain, which would make transactions more or less infeasible. This has not really happened in Bitcoin's history. Uh, depending on how you look at Bitcoin's history, this has not really occurred. 
And it seems to be coming more and more unlikely given that Bitcoin has industrialized and those Bitcoin miners are public and things of that nature. But that's not necessarily the case. And that's why we're here today to discuss what a possible 51% attack on Bitcoin could look like. And then also sort of look at the parameters of what a cost would look like for that. Uh, and then some outcomes about how we could possibly protect Bitcoin from a 51% attack if we do think it is like a, a strong enough um, problem in Bitcoin's future. So I'll hand it over to you to sort of lay the land for a 51% attack and then also the scope of the problem you're looking at. Right. So um, if you can control 51% of the hash rate, you have God mode over a very specific aspect of Bitcoin, which is you choose which blocks go on chain. And so that means that you could, for example, um, censor transactions. You could not include blocks that have certain types of transactions. <clears throat> But another thing you can do is you can censor miners themselves, like other miners, the honest miners, the defend, what I call the defending miners. This is kind of an extreme version of selfish mining where you, you're only building on top of your own blocks. And so as a defending honest miner, you're not receiving any rewards anymore. Um, and so you're kind of economically forced to shut down because there's no point in just run, running the, the mining rigs because you're not receiving any, any more Bitcoin. And... My guess is that this would be um, kind of the end of Bitcoin, the blockchain at least, or you know, the Bitcoin, the blockchain with the, 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 the current uh, security mechanism. And the reason is that if the honest miners are economically forced to sell their hardware, then now the attacker can just buy the hardware for, for pennies on the dollar and kind of reinforce the attack. And uh, one of the interesting things as well is that the attacker needs to spend almost no uh, nothing on electricity. And the reason is that the attack can be very short-lived on the order of days, right? It, it only takes a few hours for people to realize, hey, there's something very, very wrong with the Bitcoin blockchain. All the blocks are empty. There's no transactions going through. And all the honest miners are being kind of reorged and, 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 and forked out. Um, and what can happen is that there's what's called... Um, a spawn camp, attack, spawn camp attack is the term that uh, Vitalik uh, termed, which is that you can let the, the, the hash rate go down and down and down over time. And if a defending miner tries to come back online and retake control of the chain, well, the, the attacker can just temporarily return on all their, all their hardware um, and basically hit the, this, this honest miner on the head uh, and discourage them from you know, ever trying this again because ultimately they just end up wasting uh, e electricity. So for almost uh, no ongoing maintenance costs from a power perspective, the attacker can, can gain control over the chain. And I think what will happen is that not only would rational Bitcoin miners sell their hardware, but rational Bitcoin holders you know, might want to, to sell their Bitcoin. And that makes the attack even simpler because the price of Bitcoin goes down. Now there's even less of an incentive to go ahead uh, and, and mine. So, you know, people have been, um, some Bitcoiners have been thinking that 51% attacks are not a, a big deal, right? Because that might lead to, you know, temporary instability of the chain, maybe a few reorgs here and there. But I really do think that it's a, a catastrophic thing. And if you control the, the transactions, you can, you can go even further than just create, creating fully empty blocks. You could, for example, um, only allow Bitcoin transactions that go to Bitcoin exchange addresses. So you can only allow people to sell the Bitcoin, but not to buy Bitcoin. Another thing you could do is you could break um, lightning channels. So the security assumption on lightning channels is that the Bitcoin blockchain is live and that you can push forward these, these, these fraud proofs, basically. And if you, if you can't do so for an extended period of time, then an attacker can basically drain uh, pay, payment channels. Um, another thing that an attacker might try and do is um, you know very strategically do fifty one uh, like like reorg attacks on very specific wallets. So for example, um, there's about I believe five billion dollars of wrapped BTC, um, and if you can uh, reorg the chain strategically, then you know if you for example if you make a deposit in wrapped BTC, you you sell the wrapped BTC on on Ethereum and then you reorg the chain. Now you suddenly have both the proceeds of selling the wrapped BTC and the original Bitcoin that you started with. Um, and it, it's possible actually that uh, 
an, a rational attacker might come forward. Like oftentimes in my model, I assume a very powerful nation state attacker with, with hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, um, at its disposal. But actually, you know, it turns out that the, the budget is much, much more modest. It's on the order of maybe one, two, three billion dollars. And not only is the budget very, very low, um, but they could maybe try and turn a profit. So they can do these, um, these reorgs attacks on wrapped BTC, for example, but they could also just simply short, short Bitcoin. Now, if you look at the market cap of Bitcoin, it's on the order of $550 billion. And so they really just need to short on the order of 1% of the total market cap uh, to be able to, to actually turn a profit on, on, on this attack. And with every successive halvening, what happens is what's called the security ratio, which is basically the amount of value securing Bitcoin relative to its total market cap keeps going down. So right now it's you know, on the order of, let's say, half a percent or less, but every halving every four years, you know, so long as the transaction fees don't go up, then this ratio keeps on degrading. And it's possible that an, att an attacker in a not so long distant future will, will have close to a thousand to one leverage. So for every one dollar that they put in as, an, as a budget to attack Bitcoin, they can break, you know, roughly speaking, a, a thousand times the, the, the value. Yeah, there's lots of different features to this attack. Uh, so thanks for walking that out as a strong summary there. Let's go back to the beginning and, and, and talk about the contextualization for this debate for what a successful 51% attack would look like. In my mind's eye, and I haven't thought about this too deeply or nearly as deeply as you have, uh, a successful 51% attack could be as simple as for a few hours, someone is able to gain control 51% of the hash rate and start censoring transactions, uh, start to break some of the trust assumptions that most people have in their mind about what Bitcoin is. And that would negatively degrade the price of Bitcoin because people would stop thinking of Bitcoin as like the sovereign uncorruptible uh, Michael Saylor esque money and start thinking of it as maybe like a Venmo or a PayPal alternative. Like it's strong money, but it's not what we thought it was. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the entire destruction of Bitcoin, right? Like we cannot progress the chain. We cannot send transactions. Basically people still have their Raspberry Pis with Bitcoin nodes downloaded on top of them, but that's about it. You can't do anything else. So tell me a little bit about how you see this attack within that spectrum. Right. So for me, it's on the the latter end of the spectrum, the very, very bad end, where it's basically a complete break of Bitcoin, the chain at least. Um, and more likely than not, I'd say, at least if the community is not prepared with a contingency plan, possibly a break of BTC, the asset itself. And like one of the, the easy reasons to see this is that the defending honest miners just have to completely leave the system because these are businesses, they're rational entities um, that you know need to, to turn a profit and they would have only expenses and literally zero profit. And the reason they'd have zero profit is because the attacker would not allow them to, to have profit. And it's even worse than that because, uh, because of the way that Bitcoin is structured, it does not have base layer privacy. You can actually see... Um, you know, the, the, the balances of existing, of existing miners. So miners have a, a HODL address, for example, and the attacker could just say, you know, we're just strategically going to freeze those, those addresses. So not only do the miners have no uh, income, but all their savings just suddenly disappear from one day to another. They just force to liquidate, go to chapter 11 or whatever it is, and, 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 and sell their hardware. Um, and the hardware would be worth almost nothing, right? Because the well, there's some parts of the hardware that is worth something. There's the transformers, the, the, the cooling infrastructure, the fans, the cables, blah, blah, blah. That could be uh, resold. But the vast majority of the hardware, which is the, the rigs, would suddenly just l lose almost all their value from one day to another. Maybe you could rescue the PSUs or something like that, or bits and pieces, or maybe you could recycle the, the miners. But broadly speaking, uh, they would be worth almost nothing. And actually, that makes it easier for the attacker to solidify the attack. So, you know, maybe they were just about capable of getting, you know, 51% for a few hours. But now that they've done it for a few hours, they could easily grow to, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, 90% of the hash rate because all these honest miners are, are liquidating themselves. Gotcha. Okay, let's talk about the rational miners and the attackers or you call them the defenders and the attackers. 
uh, and some of the stuff we've been talking about. Can you define the two groups and uh, some features of those two groups? Right. So when we analyze kind of consensus networks, we try and categorize the different consensus participants. So we talk about, for example, honest participants that just follow the rules all the time. And then there's this more refined category of rational actors um, that you know, just try and behave in their own best interest. And then we have these malicious entities that just try and they just want to see the world burn. And they just, the only goal is to try and, and, and destroy the, the, the consensus. Now, the way that I think about it for Bitcoin is that there isn't really this concept of honest uh, miner. Like every, almost everyone's rational. They're in it as a business. They're in it for the, for, for, for the money. And you know, really their goal is to try and defend Bitcoin. And they have, they're playing the long game, right? They're buying hardware, which is going to be mining for half a decade, maybe even more. And really their goal is to try and, and defend and secure uh, uh, Bitcoin. And they have a certain set of, of economics. So for example, they care very, very deeply about uh, the, their electricity cost. They also care very, very deeply about the energy efficiency of their Bitcoin miners. And if I were to kind of categorize, you know, label as to what, what, what they care about, it would be OPEX, the, 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 the cost of maintaining this hardware. And it, the reason is that they're playing this very, very long game. So they're amortizing uh, their strategy over, over years. And then on the other hand, you have these uh, malicious or kind of attacking miners who want to try and, and break Bitcoin. And you know, they can try many things, but the, the thing that makes sense to me, in my opinion, is just to make a, a, a quick and short attack on the order of, of days. And so they're playing the, the short game. Um, and so their economics are totally, totally different because they only need to cover uh, OPEX for a few, a few days really all their cost is, is capex, the upfront cost of uh, buying or acquiring or manufacturing all this hash rate and connecting it to the grid. But the attack in of itself is <clears throat> a very quick and, and short attack. And so they have a completely different set of, of economics. And that has all sorts of repercussions in terms of the, the, the cost of attack. And like my very kind of cursory research suggests that attackers have an unfair advantage over defenders. Because if you're a defender and you're running 24 seven, there's all sorts of things that you care about. You, know, you care about um, the, the, the health of your, your mining rig. You don't want there to be too much dust or too much humidity. You care about running 24 seven, so you can't um, be moving your hardware you know, from place to place. Um, you, you, because you need to be running 24 seven, you need to be running in the summer and in the winter and, and there's all sorts of, of considerations there um, and you because you you want your hardware to last a very long time you don't want to to overclock it and, and, and stress it and things like that whereas on the other hand the the attacking miners they, they can be very opportunistic and strategic about things so they can wait for the right time to do the attack um, they don't care about humidity and and dust and you know, just maxing out their hardware, overclocking, overheating it, whatever it is, like really mistreating it because they're only going to be running this, um, this hardware for a few days, maybe a few weeks. And it's a very similar thing with energy, for example. So, you know, in order to be a profitable Bitcoin miner, let's say for the sake of example, that you need, you know, electricity under 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, if you look at the, the world map, there, isn't, there aren't that many places where you can get 10 cents per kilowatt hour. It's a very, you know, maybe pockets of energy here and there. Whereas an attacker who's, who's kind of insensitive to, to OPEX, to the price of electricity, suddenly they have the whole world available to them. And so structurally speaking, the attacker has, you know, roughly speaking, a 90 to 1 advantage in terms of selection of where, where they can draw electricity from. So yeah, there's, we, we can go through like the, these attacks uh, one by one, basically optimizations that the, uh, the, the, the attacker has at, at their disposal, which the honest um, miners don't, don't really have. Yeah, let's do that. One last question before we go in for context, just about the economic security. So you brought that up in the first few minutes of the conversation. Uh, I think the numbers I have from your notes is about $5.25 billion economic security. Uh, I'm assuming that's taking into account 
uh, the, the cost of the amount of hash rate on the network or the cost of the amount of hash rate to purchase to be able to attack the network and it would be mostly a CapEx cost. But can you define that for the listeners, how you came up with that uh, $5.25 billion security budget number? Right. So the, the definition of economic security for, for a blockchain is basically the total amount of economic resources currently securing the chain. And you can denominate it in, in, in US dollars, for example. And the way that you calculate it for, for Bitcoin is you know, very simple, is that you, you take the, the total hash rate, which is you know, on, on the order of 350 million terahashes per second. And then you multiply that by the, 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 the cost of hash rate. Now, um, it turns out that you know, different miners have different you know, cost of, of hash rate, but a, con a seemingly conservative one is $15 per, per terahash per second. So you can go on various websites and, 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 and buy spot um, like this, this, this mining equipment. And this cost uh, kind of also includes the setup cost. So when you're uh, buying a Bitcoin miner, not only do you need to buy that, but you also need to buy the transformers, the cooling, the, the electrical equipment and, and whatnot. Um, now, um, you know, we, we discussed this in the pre-call yesterday, but there's, there's a, basically a cost per uh, me megawatt that you need to put forward. And it, it varies from miner to miner. You know, it could be $100,000 per, per megawatt. It could be 350000 if you're not very sophisticated. But my guess is that if you're going to be an attacker doing this, you're going to be very sophisticated. So you're going to be paying closer to um, $100,000 per, per, per megawatt. And, you know, just as I said previously, that a lot of this infrastructure costs, you know, transformers, um, cooling equipment, this is to a large extent commoditized. So you can actually resell it and actually pay only maybe $50,000 per, 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 per megawatt because you will only be using it for, for a few weeks. Uh, and maybe even you don't even need to buy it. You can just rent it out if there's the, the capacity to go ahead and, and, and rent it out. So this is my kind of starting point as kind of a conservative upper bound on how much it would cost to go attack Bitcoin uh, on the order of you know, $5.25 billion. And if you compare that to the um, market cap of Bitcoin, it's on the order of 1%. So for a 1% investment, you can go break uh, the, 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 whole, the whole network, at least from a, the, in terms of budget that you need to put forward to go attack Bitcoin. But it you know, as we can talk about, my my kind of my claim is that the actual cost that that uh, an attacker would have to put forward is much much less. It's on the order of three times less. So it it would be you know on the order of one point five billion dollars, something like that. And um, you know we can go through one by one the the, the 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 reasoning, but it turns out that you know as I mentioned, there's like there's certain strategies that are available uh, to to the attacker. Uh, that the the honest miners would would just not want to to even uh, explore. Yeah, thanks for letting the context there. Uh, appreciate it. So yeah, but we have like a five billion dollar budget, so so to speak, for Bitcoin security, and an attacker would need to essentially put an investment in between one and two billion dollars. And we've already established that there's ways for them to earn profit on top of this attack. Um, so now we'll go through the optimizations as you put it and you, you kind of ran through them at the beginning, but I'll list them out here for, for the listeners of the show and then we'll go through them one by one. Uh, some of the things that we can reduce the cost would be the mining rigs. Uh, there's some things we can do with like the ASIC manufacturing side. Um, the next thing would be like market manipulation. You can uh, squeeze the price of Bitcoin in order to like sort of uh, get some of these other miners out of the way. Um, there's some timing attacks, you know, t attack during a certain part of the season for weather, attack for uh, time of Bitcoin network, like during halvings or bear markets. Uh, there's some sabotage tactics even in here because we're not necessarily assuming that everyone's doing things legally in this situation. Uh, so let's go through these optimizations. They're all really fascinating, um, starting off with the uh, reducing the cost of ASIC mining rigs. Right. So the, the, the main cost for the attacker will be this capex of just acquiring the, 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 the mining rigs. Now, um, the brute force way of attacking Bitcoin would be to look at the existing amount of hash rate, 350 million terahashes per second, and, and, and matching it. And that would you know, bring us to this roughly $5.25 billion attack. But actually, there's already off the bat, there's kind of a, a 2x optimization, which is that 
if you go and acquire half of the mining farms, then that's actually sufficient. So you kind of, instead of trying to just brute force the attack, you kind of infiltrate the Bitcoin network and corrupt, as it were, half of them. Now, you know, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, is there, you know, half half of the the, the mining farms that are willing to to sell? Um, and my my claim is that maybe yes, it feels likely, and the reason is that these are, are rational actors, and if you're willing to pay slightly above market prices uh, for 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 their hardware, then they they would go ahead and 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 sell it. Um, now, one of the things that might actually make it easier to go ahead and acquire this 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 hardware is to to time it around the halving, right? Because there's some subset of miners that are already planning to shut down, um, and you could just go and approach them and say, "Hey, after the halving, there's no need for you to shut down. Um, I will actually buy the hardware off you, hardware which to you is like." waste almost it's not worth anything if anything it's a liability because you need to go ahead and disconnect it and transport it to the to 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 wherever it needs to be uh, discarded yeah assuming that you can go ahead and and, and acquire half um of these these uh mining farms then then you know that that re reduces by a factor of two roughly the 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 cost of attack um and I guess a, 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 another kind of optimization on, on top of that is what I call um, rig boosting. So it turns out that most uh, miners, um, at least under certain conditions, you know, if, if for example, we're in a, a bear market and the price of Bitcoin is very low or there's some sort of oversupply of mining rigs, they will tend to really favor energy efficiency. And one way to do that is to actually underclock uh, their mining rigs, and they can do that with firmware, for example. Now, um, the uh, 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 a, a Bitcoin mining uh, attacker actually has the exact opposite strategy, right? They want to get as much hash rate as they can for the hash rate that they bought. Um, and so they want to go ahead and overclock it. And not only that, but they're actually willing to overclock it far beyond what the commercial firmwares are actually doing, right? Because commercial firmwares are catering for a very specific market, which is you know, commercial miners that are willing to mine for, for years and years. But um, if, you're, if you're an attacker, you only want to run the hardware for a few days. And so you can basically write your own firmware, which boosts it even further when the, the commercial firmware uh, does. And so if you look at, if you, for example, acquire a farm, um, and it's it's currently underclocking um, because it's it's reaching the 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 end of the the lifetime of this this hardware. You know, it's planning to shut down at the halving. Well, you you can maybe get a, a fifty percent boost uh, on that. And the reason is that not only would you not be underclocking it, but you'd be overclocking it on top of that, and you'd be overclocking it to 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 the max. Um, and so in 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 that situation, if you have if you acquire roughly one third of the of the hash rate and you boost it by fifty percent, then tada! You know you've reached your your fifty one percent threshold. So um, that's kind of one way to see that you know roughly dividing by three, the the the, 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 the your your budget is sufficient because you only need to go ahead and acquire one third of the mining farms and then and then boost them. One idea that I had this morning on the on the boosting is that you you can do what I call hemisphere arbitrage. So, and this, this goes back to this, this idea of timing the attack properly. So it turns out that most of the miners um, are, in the, are in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and, you know, especially during the summer, you know, they, they might be incentivized to, uh, to underclock a little bit because that would reduce the amount of, of, of heat that, that, that's generated, especially in, in, in some places like Texas, where, where cooling could be, could, could be an issue. And so one of the things you, 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 you could do is basically um, set up your mining rigs in, in the, the southern hemisphere, where it's the exact opposite. It's going to be winter. And, and it kind of makes the, the, the boosting even, even simpler because you benefit as an attacker from the tailwind of winter. And then all the defenders that are in the northern hemisphere have this, this headwind of, of the, the, the summer heat uh, that, that's making the attack uh, harder. 
And then there's this other form of self of boosting, which is selfish mining. So this is an attack that's been known for a very long time, but one which the commercial miners don't do because it would really you know, damage the, their reputation if people found out that they were doing selfish mining. But the idea of selfish mining is that in some circumstances, that is actually uh, rational to not immediately broadcast the blocks that you've uh, recently mined. And the reason is that if you don't broadcast the block that you just recently mined, you are in a privileged position. You kind of have kind of insider information in terms of being able to build the next block, which you can just build on top of, of, of your, your, the block that you haven't uh, broadcast. And then once another miner broadcasts their block, well, now maybe you've mined already a, a chain of length two on top of what's publicly known. And so you broadcast these two blocks together and now suddenly you're the longest chain and you've wasted effort on, on, on the other miners. And you, know, you might be able to get roughly speaking a 10% boost with, with, with selfish mining. So instead of needing, let's say 33% of the hash rate, you only need roughly 30%. Uh, of, of, of the hash rate. So I want to go back to the, uh, the seasonality thing because I think it's an interesting point that you're making there. Uh, <clears throat> specifically for this attack, like you're co completely focused on the timing, right? Where like the attacker can choose when and where to do this at any moment. So you mentioned uh, you could do it during the winter in the Southern Hemisphere and then the Northern Hemisphere every summer. We know that there's a lot of hash rate in Texas right now and in summer. Uh, we've already seen many of these miners actually curtailing during the summer months. So you could pair with a curtailment event where there'd be a lot of these defenders. Would, they'd be offline because it's profitable to be offline. And then the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you just start boosting your miners at the same time. So that's an interesting uh, note. What are some other things around timing that you think would play into this? You mentioned the halving, uh, bear market, maybe some other thoughts there. One of the things that honest miners care about is, is running a sustained business over the whole year. I mean, maybe with a few exceptions, they're willing to curtail or shut down for, for a few hours here and there. But generally speaking, they want to run 24-7. Um, so no, one, one of the things that the, the attacking miner can do is just pick a location where um, it just turns out there's a, there's a lot of excess electricity, but for a very small amount of time. So right now I'm in Montenegro, for example, and Montenegro just happens to be um, a very uh, touristy country. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because uh, I went to visit this town where in the winter they have about 20,000 uh, people living in this village. And then in the summer where it's very touristy, they have 200,000 people living there. So it's kind of a 10x delta between the summer and, and the winter. And... You know, if you were a, a, a rational Bitcoin miner, like this specific location might not be suitable because, you know, you can only use it half the time. And then the other half the time, you'd have to you know, physically move your, your hardware from one place to another. And it becomes, you know, maybe the, the friction of moving your hardware is, is, is not worth it. I mean, to be fair, maybe it is worth it because there was, I think there was this uh, interesting story of uh, uh, Bitcoin miners in China that were following the wet season and the dry season and, 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 and the hydro. But you, basically, you can take the strategy to the extreme and just pick like the one week where, for example, there's just tons and tons and tons of water and the hydros are just generating so much ex ex excess electricity. And, and that's where you go, uh, you know, make, make, make your attack. But you're right, like there's, there's all sorts of other timing attacks that you can do. So you can try and time things around the bear market, around uh, a halving, which you know, will, should be painful for the miners. You could time it around some sort of like unexpected market irregularity. Like for some reason, something happens, COVID happens, um, you know, the Fed does something strange and then the price of Bitcoin kind of tanks by, by 30%. You know, as, a, as an attacker, again, you are time insensitive. Like you know that you want to perform the attack in the next, let's say, three years. You're happy to wait for the, 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 an opportune moment within those three years. On the other hand, you know, Bitcoin miners, the rational ones, have a very, very strong preference, right? They literally need to be online 24-7 uh, 
and uh, and and that is a, a, a big advantage that the the attacker has. So let's go back to the ASIC side of things. I think we kind of covered like the facility side of things and like the seasonality. On the ASIC side, you mentioned that during a bear market or a near halving event where the price of ASIC hardware is going down, you could purchase a lot of the, that equipment. Uh, one other thing you brought up was like you could actually purchase a manufacturer if the timing conditions were right and start to you know produce those ASICs for yourself. Tell me a little bit about that. Would you think that's more of like a private play, like a private company would be able to purchase that? Or do you think that's more of a nation state play given like the size and dominance of the three largest ASIC manufacturers? How do you consider those things? There are some like boutique kind of small Bitcoin miners that might be available for acquisition for a very, very cheap price, especially if they're on the verge of bankruptcy. And you can basically just buy their IP or whatever it is and, and have access to it. And one of the advantage of being the producer of hardware is that you don't suffer the profit margins. So, right, so when you buy a rig from Bitmain or Canon or whatever it is, a micro BT, um, there's some profit margin in there, which is which is baked in, um, and 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 that should actually be considered in the cost of attack. So, really, if we really want to be paranoid, we should be asking ourselves: What if Bitmain itself? were to do the attack? You know, what if the Chinese government were to compel Bitmain to do the attack? Well, for them, it wouldn't cost you know, $1.6 billion. It might cost them only $1 billion because the 0. 0.6 would be their profit margin that they're not just simply not taking in, in, in this case. So yeah, I think there is an opportunity potentially to, to buy a Bitcoin miner if, if you can't just acquire uh, the, the mining farms, because that's that if, if you want to be really, really lazy, that's just the, the simplest way to do it. And by the way, one of the things that you want to do if you're going to acquire one third or, or so of the, the mining farms is you want to be using shell companies. You don't want people to realize that there's this one like centralized entity that's buying up everything. You want to do it slowly over time, use shell entities, try and obfuscate as much as possible that, 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 that something is, is, is going on there. But there's, if you are willing to uh, manufacture hardware, there's all sorts of optimisms, uh, optimizations that become uh, available. So, um, and it basically all boils down to uh, CapEx versus OpEx. So the way that we manufacture uh, ASICs right now, at least competitive ASICs, is that we're gonna use the most bleeding edge process node. It could be you know, five nanometer or three nanometer, I don't know. Um, and another thing to consider is the, the type of transistors that are used. So when you're um, making a, an, an ASIC, there's this so-called you know, PPA kind of trade-off space. There's a power performance area. And more often than not, like my, my guess is that these, these, these mining ASICs will heavily, heavily try and optimize for power. And so they're kind of exploring this one corner of the trade-off space. Whereas an attacker, they don't care about power. They don't care about OPEX. They really care about capex and so they want to use tiny tiny transistors so that they can squeeze as much hash rate per air, a unit area of, of silicon and another thing uh is yeah is is, is on the, the the node that they choose so they can just go ahead and and choose 28 nanometer which is kind of an outdated node but um the the cost per unit area is going to be much much lower than than three nanometer you, you generally speaking you you pay a huge premium for the really advanced nodes. And the reason is that you know, very sophisticated companies like Apple and, and Samsung and whatever are just buying up everything. And so there's a lot of competition, but there's almost no competition for the 28 nanometer uh, node. And so you, you, can, you can get access to, to, this, to this node for very, very cheap. And you know, there's an optimization game to be played here, which is to pick the exact right node, which gives you the right trade-off in terms of, of minimizing your your, 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 your capex because what what tends to happen with the, the the older nodes is that the transistors are themselves naturally bigger right that you, you don't have as much miniaturization um, but what tends to happen is that the the cost of the node kind of overpowers the the gains that you have from miniaturization um, another thing that you can try and do is just completely change the sha256 um, circuit uh, design so I don't even I don't really know what there is going on, but I imagine there's all sorts of tricks to just save on on power uh, that are being leveraged by Bitmain and all these other companies. Well, if you were to just design from scratch your own SHA-256 that is optimized for for OPEX, you, you, you sorry for CapEx, you, you you might actually end up 
you know, only spending, I don't, let's say something extreme, like, like $1 per terahash per second. Something like this is dramatically cheaper simply because you're starting from scratch and you're optimizing for a totally different uh, a problem. And so I think if uh, Bitcoin ever were to reach very large amounts of economic security, let's say the price of Bitcoin goes to a million dollars like Balaji expected, um, then um, you know, maybe your best strategy and you know, the economic security grows to $100 billion. Maybe your best strategy really is to go manufacture your own hardware because you'll be, you'll be able to, you're, you're, to, to get CapEx, which is you know, 10 or, or 50x <laughs> cheaper than, than what you could get otherwise. Love it. Yeah, there's definitely like a lot of different attack vectors here that uh, are worth exploring, or at least like discussing the nuances of each one that you're bringing up to the table. Let's talk about a few more. Uh, let's talk about the sabotage attack. So this is sort of like moving more into like the illegal side of things, or if you're a nation state, the ability to make the rules on the fly. Uh, in this instance, you bring up the power supplies between some of these larger operations, uh, like the the snip snip attack, as you say. Uh, and then you also bring up the fact that there's you know only so many substations in the U.S. and a lot of these bigger Bitcoin mining farms, the defenders in this case, like the the neutral parties, they're all connected to very many similar, similar substations. So walk us through that part. In in your effort to go, um, you know acquire uh, farms you might find some farms that are very, very stubborn and just don't want to be acquired and so they're like staunchly on the defender camp and want to stay there well what you could try and do um, is to just sabotage these these uh, defending miners and one of the things that i found pretty amazing is, is just looking at photos aerial photos of bitcoin mines if you look at them it's like this massive you know operation and then there's these tiny, tiny cables, which are basically the high voltage power lines that connect this massive operation to, to the real world. And it turns out, you know, you can just do this snip zip attack, as you put it, which is you just need to cut one or two cables over a distance of kilometers and kilometers to take down this whole operation. And so you could potentially, you know, just take down 1% you know, of the hash rate in one fell swoop just by cutting one or two cables. And, you know, if you're... If you're an attacker, you could hi hire a saboteur for whatever it is, $100,000 to go cut these, these, these cables and, and cause a, 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 a basically a, a lot of stress on, on, on these miners. Um, now, one of the things that I learned a couple of days ago is that um, not only are these kilometers and kilometers of power lines extremely vulnerable, you know, you're not going to be putting a security guard every 100 meters, that doesn't make sense, uh, but the, um, the substations uh, like the grid itself is extremely vulnerable. So um, there's about 55,000 uh, substations in the US. And there's this uh, documentary by Vice, which kind of explains that an attacker that takes down nine of these substations, nine very strategically chosen substations, can actually uh, produce a coast to coast blackout. Uh, <laughs> and the reason is that, um, you know, the the, the grid is extremely centralized, at least in the US and in many other countries. And there's these knock-on effects where if you take down some of the key nodes, uh, then that, that, that has ripple effects. And one of the things that the, the, this Vice uh, kind of interview goes into is that for the vast majority of these critical substations, there's just almost no security. Um, so again, you could just hire a saboteur, you know, with, for you know, a, few hundred, a few hundred grand. And then you know they could come with like special things like these these uh, like shield piercing uh, guns and and ammunitions and 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 basically take down uh, like the grid for some period of time. Um, now it, it it turns out that some of these transformers are are commoditized and easily replaceable, but some of them are actually extremely specialized and very very rare, uh, and so they kind of need to be manufactured and transported and. It was kind of claimed that you know you could potentially take down the grid for weeks because it just takes so much time to replace these very specialized pieces of of electrical in, uh, in infrastructure. Now, of course, if you're only targeting the miners, the Bitcoin miners, you don't need to go coast to coast, right? You don't need to take down nine substations. It's possible that I don't know two substations, three substations, I don't know, but some much smaller number of substations, or or maybe uh, like substations that are especially close to the miners. Uh, maybe some of the smaller ones that that are you know relevant to the miners, uh, and because they're smaller, they're probably even less secure <laughs> secure than the than, than the big critical ones. Um, 
So yeah, I think sabotage, if, if the attacker is willing to do illegal stuff, which is not at all what I, what I you know, suggest anyone does, uh, but it, it, it is potentially a, a tool with, with, with high leverage. Yeah, I think like this sort of attack makes more sense as you start thinking about like the nation state stuff where you know, some sort of government does not want Bitcoin to be some sort of dominant money out there. And so they, they go for the throat to choke. That would be some of these mining farms. Uh, tell me a little bit on the last part about like the extreme situations, regulatory tax on mining companies, bombing, even mining farms. Like, how do you see any of that playing out or do you see that being a, a part of this sort of attack? You know, when when I work on Ethereum, you know what I usually say is I, I try to make Ethereum World War Three grade resistant, and so we make all sorts of crazy assumptions like what happens if ninety percent of the validators just go offline from one day to another because there's been some nuclear attack, um, and you know the, the the goal is to try and get the chain you know keeping having it uh, run. Now one of the you know, features I guess of Bitcoin mining is that it's very very easy to know where these mining farms are. Uh, they leave uh, a heat signature, which can be, uh, which is visible from space even, <laughs> and um, and you know they also leave uh, you know kind of a, an electrical footprint uh, sig signature. So it's easy for, for for the grid operators to 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 sniff them out in the same way that they sniff out, for example, cannabis uh, operations. Um, and I think it was maybe the New York Times, or I forget, that kind of cataloged like all the large Bitcoin mining farms in the US and they found, I forget what it was, 42 or so. And so to a very large extent, we know exactly, you know, down to the meter where these operations are. And so if we were to enter some sort of World War Three scenario, then is it really implausible that, you know, some of these operations could strategically be, be, be taken down? Like one of the things that, you know, is, is a reality of, of Bitcoin today is that to a very large extent, there's there's no Bitcoin happening in China, right? Bitcoin has been banned. Uh, you know, you can't hold it, you can't trade it, you can't discuss it even in the press. You can't mine it there, and so China, as a kind of a, a nation state, has a huge incentive to see the success of Bitcoin not happen, right? Because if it were to happen, it would be non-Chinese people who would profit out of it. And so if for some reason or another, Bitcoin were to become a kind of world money and China would, would stand to lose, you know, almost everything, uh, then, you know, they just need to send a couple of bombs here and there and, uh, and, that, and that's, that's taken care of. Yeah, it's definitely like a more aggressive attack, but certainly worth, worth paying attention to. Uh, I want to take a step back and kind of ask you, like, how would you see sort of something like this occurring? Because there's so many different parts to the, the package and this attack that you're sort of discussing in a rational package, I guess, how would you see someone proceeding with an attack like this, uh, like selecting some of the optimizations that would make the most sense? Right. So I, I guess it depends like who the attacker is. Um, the attacker could be a nation state, in which case they don't really care too much about cost optimization. And I think if you can get it down to $2 billion, like it's already um, good, good enough. Um, and 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 really, it's a matter of, of of pulling it off. Now, one of the the tools that I we haven't discussed yet is this idea of market manipulation and this idea of credible commitments. So the the game theory of credible commitments is that if you can make a credible commitment about an event happening in the future, then really all rational actors should, should believe that this event will indeed happen, and um, you know they should plan for it. And so one of the things you could do is you could make a credible commitment to attacking uh, Bitcoin. So for example, China could say tomorrow, we're going to attack uh, Bitcoin. Another way to, to make a credible commitment is to actually do it economically. So the, an attacker for, could, for example, take $100 million and then put it in a smart contract on, on Ethereum. And the smart contract will destroy the $100 million unless a proof that a 51% attack on Bitcoin ha has occurred. So for example, the proof could be like a very long chain of a thousand blocks, all of which are empty. Um, and, and, and once you have these, these, these credible commitments, rational actors like, like Bitcoin holders and Bitcoin miners are actually incentivized to, to sell as, as quickly as possible. And here you kind of have this, this race to sell, right? If you're the first one to sell, you're actually in a much better position than the last one who's gonna sell. Um, and you know that could be potentially a strategy that is used to go acquire the farms. 
you know, you go visit the farm and you're going to explain, hey, you have two choices. Either you sell it to us today for a reasonable price or, you know, you, or, you, know you have the opportunity to sell it after we've attacked, but at that point it will be too late and your farm won't be worth anything. So it can, it can almost be used as blackmail to basically um, force the attack into, in, 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 into reality. And not only uh, do we have the miners as rational actors, but we have the Bitcoin holders. So Bitcoin holders who could see publicly that there's this credible commitment going on, um, either because the nation state said, you know, we're going to do the attack or because there's this economic uh, proof that there is a commitment to making the attack, they would be incentivized to sell and thereby making the attack even easier. Now, another class of actors other than nation states would actually be, you know, business magnates of sorts. Um, so if you take, you know, Elon Musk, he spent $40 billion on, on Twitter, you know, for him, $2 billion is pocket change. He can go attack Bitcoin, you know, 20 times over. Um, and like some people could potentially be convinced to, to try this attack for, for profit, like as a, as a, as a profitable, you know, exercise. And um, one way to do that is by shorting uh, a Bitcoin in relatively large quantities. So it's almost an insider trading attack. You know personally that uh, the price of Bitcoin is going to attack because you have the power to go at, uh, do, do, do this attack. Um, and it turns out that the, the process of shorting Bitcoin itself makes the attack simpler. And the reason is that it puts sell pressure on, on BTC, the asset, which reduces the price, which squeezes out some of the... Um, the, 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 the less profitable uh, defending miners uh, that have kind of economically forced to shut down the operations because they're not in energy efficient enough or their cost of electricity is too high. And by the way, this is called a, a, a displacement attack where what you can do if, if, if you're ready to basically acquire very old hardware, for example, and bring it back onto the grid or do the boosting that we talked about or even manufacturing hash rate, then every time you add uh, you know, whatever it is, 100 million terahash per, terahashes per second, you're actually forcing out some fraction of that. So maybe half of it, let's say 50 million terahashes per second is kind of economically displaced because you're coming in. And that also makes the attack uh, sim simpler to, to, to execute and, and should be taken into consideration in, in, in the models. But yeah, one of the things that I've, I've realized is um, that this whole space of of thinking, you know, mainly about the capex and not the opex, is very, very um, un un underexplored. And I've been talking about, you know, various people about this attack here um, in, in in Montenegro, and every day we'd come up with a new optimization. So I think um, if if an attacker were to hire like a small team of analysts or a small team of consultants or whatever it is, they might actually find further optimizations that brings the attack like really, really, really low. And then it might become just a, a, a profitable strategy for some like very uneth unethical, uh, you know, person or entity who's willing to pull off the attack. Uh, but you know, it just takes one crazy billionaire at this point to to attack Bitcoin. Okay, so we have a lot of optimizations done. I'm sure there's more that uh, we could come up with or think about or discuss a little bit uh, in more detail. But let's talk about some of the things that you think like Bitcoin should do in order to uh, prevent one of these attacks, assuming that we think that this is like all possible or, or, or going to occur, what could the Bitcoin community do in order to change? Uh, for those listening, I think an instructive thing, if you're interested in learning more about this, is probably the 51% attacks that occurred on Ethereum Classic back in 2020. I believe there's like three 51% attacks in a row. And the Ethereum Classic team tried a few different methods to prevent these attacks from occurring again. Uh, it was a pretty interesting time for that network and I think instructive to this conversation. But I will hand it over to you, Justin, to talk about like what are some things that you think that Bitcoin could do to protect itself from an external attack like this? Some of the optimizations that I mentioned could potentially be used by the defenders. So some of the boosting strategies, for example. So if you look at selfish mining, the honest players could also collude with each other and coordinate a, a selfish mining operation. Um, another thing that could potentially happen is that the, the existing miners that have skin in the game, they can try and, and suddenly just start overclocking their hardware and kind of doing a counter, counter uh, defense to the, to, to the offense. Um, but all of these are like 
in a way relatively weak uh, in the sense that um, the attacker just needs like slightly more budget to go to go uh, do do this. And you know maybe we're asking a little bit too much in terms of the defenders to coordinate, right? Because it, it really is a bad look if Bitcoin has to you know, do selfish mining in order to defend itself. And it's also a bad look if we're basically asking the, the rational miners to behave irrationally, um, to you know, may maybe spend more in electricity than they re receive it in terms of, of, of Bitcoin rewards, purely for the sake of, of, of uh, securing Bitcoin. Now, in terms of what could be done, what could be salvaged, I think at a minimum, and this is great news, uh, BTCD asset can be salvaged. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we could see a decoupling of Bitcoin, the blockchain, and BTCD assets. So Bitcoin, the blockchain dying doesn't mean that the asset has to, has to die. Um, and like one very, quote, easy thing that can be done is to just make an ERC-20 token, which kind of exactly snapshots the, to the, the, the state of UTXOs at a specific point in time and then creates equivalent uh, ERC-20 tokens. But there is kind of a, a downside to that is that you're, you're potentially leaving a lot of granularity and, 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 and small contracts that exist on Bitcoin today. So, you know, we have the ordinals, we have the BRC-20s, we have the lightning channels that are open. And so really you want to try and preserve all this structure if you were to uh, jettison the Bitcoin, the, the, the blockchain. And it turns out there's a very easy way to do that which is to create um, a Bitcoin rollup on top of another chain, which is secure. Uh, so for example, you could do a Bitcoin rollup on top, on top of Ethereum. And you could even keep proof of work if you wanted to. So proof of work would stay there as a, a mechanism to, for distribution, but it wouldn't stay there as a mechanism for security. So you just copy paste the rules of Bitcoin, put them as a rollup uh, on top of Ethereum, and you'd preserve both the token and the structure of the small contracts, as well as proof of work as a, as a distribution mechanism. Now, if it turns out that uh, Bitcoiners just find it totally unpalatable to move to Ethereum, uh, like other things need to happen. Basically, they, the, the, I think the Bitcoin blockchain needs to change. Um, one of the very easy changes is to have tail issuance. So to kind of jettison this uh, social contract that there will only be 21 million Bitcoin and just have, for example, a 1% tail issuance. And that will basically guarantee that the security ratio won't degrade over time. So as I was saying at the very beginning, every time there's a halving and the transaction fees don't keep up, um, then the, the security ratio suffers and that gives you know, potentially a huge amount of leverage uh, for an attacker. So you want the total amount of value securing the chain to be you know, relatively large compared to the total uh, value that is being secured. Um, so that's, that, that's one very, very simple change. It's just a few lines of code to remove the, the 21 million uh, limit and the Bitcoin as a community could come to consensus to do so. Um, another thing that is possible is to make uh, Bitcoin more expressive so that it can basically gather more transaction fees. So one of the things that we've noticed empirically is that um, transaction fees can sustainably fund the security of a blockchain. And we've seen this uh, on Ethereum because the, the amount of transaction fees that we have are greater than the issuance. And that leads to actually uh, the, the Ethereum supply decreasing because transaction fees are burnt. Um, and like roughly speaking, um, the, the EVM on Ethereum is, is producing on the order of 10x more uh, transaction fees than, than Bitcoin. And so in a way you could say that the fact that Bitcoin is not expressive, as expressive as Ethereum, is a, a, a 10x degradation in security. So uh, Bitcoin has a very kind of easy option here. It's just to, do you want to become 10x more secure from one day to another? Yes, well, just become more expressive. If you become as expressive as Ethereum, then, then maybe you can become 10x more secure because you'd have 10x more fees. And ultimately, if you're not willing to compromise on the 21 million limit, then you only have fees. And so your security is basically linear in the amount of fees. And so expressiveness is a huge unlock uh, for, for, for Bitcoin. Uh, another possible option is just to um, dramatically improve the, uh, the efficiency of, of Bitcoin as a consensus network. So what do I mean by efficiency? I mean 
the ratio of the amount that you need to uh, you know, give to the, to the consensus participants relative to the amount of security that you get from those consensus participants. Now, one of the things that we, we know empirically, um, just because the two systems exist in parallel, is that proof of stake is roughly 10x more efficient. So for every unit of issuance or of reward that we give these consensus participants, we get 10 times more uh, economic economic security. And today, um, for example, Ethereum enjoys $35 billion of economic security, which is roughly uh, you know, 10x more than, more than Bitcoin. And it, it can do so at a fraction of the issuance. Um, and, and that's purely because of, of technical technological innovation. Um, just basically improving the efficiency of an engine. You can think of it as moving from a combustion engine to an electric engine is like a shift of paradigm and the cost of security goes down significantly. Um, and then I think a very interesting option that you know, Bitcoiners may want to consider is uh, fee smoothing. So if you're only going to uh, be secured by fees, you want to be secured by fees during the bear market in addition to during the bull market. And it turns out that uh, Ethereum has invented a mechanism called EIP-1559, which is basically a, a smoothing mechanism for fees. So what can happen is that during bull markets, um, there could be an accumulation of big, uh, Bitcoin tokens uh, for, for, the, for the bear markets to go you know, secure the, the, the bear markets. So you could have a, a smoothing on the order of, of, of years and, and, and not have to, to suffer from the, the cyclicality and the spikiness of, of, of transaction fees. Um, so one of the things that we, we know empirically just by looking at the, the 15 years of data roughly that we have for Bitcoin transaction fees is that it, 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 transaction fees kind of go crazy for some period of time. And it's the same on Ethereum. And then there's these prolonged bear markets. Um, and really what happens is that during the during the bull markets, you're overpaying for security, and then during the bear markets, you're underpaying, and you're actually exposed to an attacker. And going back to this timing thing that we mentioned, the fact that there's this cyclicality is amazing for the attacker because they just pick the right moment where Bitcoin is is the weakest to go uh, perform the attack. It's like stabbing someone in you know from the back in the dark. You know they're just not expecting it. Um, and this, this idea of smoothing the transaction fees over prolonged periods of time removes this uh, one of the timing attacks that's available to, to the attacker. Any thoughts on like some of the more classic 51% attack protection mechanisms we've seen, uh, such as like changing the hashing algorithm. So you're like basically nuking everyone's hardware, everyone's starting from zero. Uh, there's all other things I've seen, such as like, uh, checkpoints where every you know, hundred, every thousand blocks, you have a checkpoint that everyone has to sync up to, and then past that, everything is basically finalized. Um, so if you do, if you are rolled back, like you at least have a checkpoint for everyone to build on top of um, things of that nature. Any any thoughts on those? Right. So checkpoints are helpful if you want to prevent uh, reorg attacks. So there's some class of 51% attacks where you're basically going back in the past and you're rewriting history, and you could use that, for example, to uh, to to abuse the wrapped BTC token, as I mentioned uh, earlier. But uh, what I was arguing in, earlier in the show is that doesn't even if you don't care about rewriting history, just just nullifying the future is sufficient. Just just have empty blocks for the for the foreseeable future and just fork off all the all the honest miners that they're, they're forced to to leave the system. So I think checkpoints doesn't doesn't help for this uh, censorship attack. Um, in terms of changing the, the, the hashing algorithm and nuking everything, that is one of the big downsides of, of, of proof of work. So if you, unfortunately with proof of work, you have to nuke everyone, both the good guys and the bad guys. You can't just nuke the good guys, sorry, the bad guys. Uh, and then with proof of stake, there's this kind of unfair advantage that it has, which is that you can very precisely identify the bad guys and just nuke them only and carve them out. It's a little bit like, identifying a cancer and very carefully excising it and removing the cancer, but you, you leave the body, the rest of the, the, the organism uh, a, a alive. So the option that you have, if you want to you know, start from scratch with proof of work and, and, and nuke everyone is that you, you start with essentially zero dollars of economic security. Now, the good news is that there's some um, hardware which is already distributed and commoditized. So there's mainly two types of hardware. There's CPUs and GPUs. And so what Bitcoin could 
potentially try and do is have a, a GPU-based uh, proof-of-work uh, algorithm. But then what happens is that this gives you one more life, right? It gives you one more life through a GPU type mining algorithm. But then what happens is that the attacker can just pull the exact same attack, but this time with GPUs. And then you might think, okay, wait, hold on. Maybe Bitcoiners have a third life because they can use a, a CPU based uh, algorithm. Um, and that's true, but then the attacker again could just overwhelm the system and do the exact same optimizations that they did, but this time with 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 CPUs. You know, I think the the whole process of nuking all the all the miners in and of itself might be just so so destructive to to the confidence and to the you know the the Bitcoin token that the price of Bitcoin will 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 will, will go down and. Actually, the, the second life is really not a, a full second life. It's like a, a half life or a quarter of a life because the price of Bitcoin went down by a factor of two or a factor of four. Um, and so pulling the, the, off the attack again is actually uh, quite, quite a bit simpler. Um, now, one of the very interesting um, things that I heard was that um, apparently some of the Bitcoin uh, mining uh, manufacturers have a kind of secret, secret circuitry um, within their proof of work algorithms. And so maybe there's like a tiny, tiny tweak to the SHA-256 mining algorithm, which just changes a few bits here and there. And this could be very helpful if the attacker went down the path of manufacturing their own hardware and they were not aware of this secret, uh, secret uh, circuitry. So if if the attacker kind of you know builds on this outdated uh, process like 28 nanometer with the, their own specialized transistors and their own specialized circuits and they forget to put in the secret thing then um you know like the big manufacturers like bitmain and whatnot that had coordinated ahead of time can so ta-da you know we have this uh, this way to basically excise only the attacker because only the attacker doesn't have the secret circuitry now the problem that i see with this is that it it requires uh, quite a bit of coordination between the existing manufacturers. And it requires you to do so in such a way that the, the secret uh, circuitry stays secret. Now, if there's, let's say, five manufacturers, um, you, you kind of need all five to, to like perfectly um, keep that a secret. And so maybe you know, one of the things that could happen is that the, the attacker acquires like one of them and just somehow finds a secret. Or maybe if it's a nation state, they could have some sort of espionage kind of mission going on just to de-risk this possibility of, of their having a secret uh, circuitry. Yeah, the coordination problem there would be pretty extreme. Let's, let's finish up the conversation talking about the ideological side with this. Uh, you and I talked about like Bitcoin maximalism and the, the bleed over from Bitcoin maximalism into Bitcoin miners. From my understanding and talking to Bitcoin miners, most Bitcoin miners are profit driven because they have gone bankrupt many times within their short Bitcoin mining life. And they realize that in order to keep mining profitably, sometimes you have to steer into altcoins. Sometimes you have to make decisions that, you know, maybe you don't want to mine that coin, but you have to keep your mine alive. And so I, I would say that Bitcoin miners are probably like 30 to 40% maximalist, but for the most part, the, the majority is just agnostic to uh, whatever. At the end of the day, they like to mine Bitcoin and they like to have a job. And so that's why I care about it. For this attack, why that matters, as you sort of articulated, is that you could get some of these neutral miners to play into the game because, again, they don't want to take a huge loss on their investment. Uh, so they might be rationally motivated to assist in the attack or sit out the attack or uh, pay, play some part in it as well. Can you walk me through that as we sort of end up here? One of the very big considerations around this attack is around um, how pragmatic it is, right? It's all well and good that on paper, it only costs a few billion dollars, but you do need to be very motivated and you do need to have very good coordination. Um, and, you know, you don't want to go ahead and, for example, build your own power plant that would just be absolutely crazy and even you know manufacturing your own hardware you know you'd rather just avoid doing that because it's it's a hassle and it also limits your your optionality as a, as an attacker it means that you need to wait let's say two years before you have all the hardware before you can do the attack and in terms of pragmatic you know of being pragmatic about the attack i, I really think the easiest is just to acquire as you said these these rational miners that are they 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 don't really have, uh, they're just there for the money. 
they don't necessarily have a strong ideology and they don't necessarily even realize that they're being acquired by an attacker because you know you're using these shell companies or whatever it is or maybe you know you have some sort of just new very large player in the space who just just says that they're very bullish about bitcoin and they want to mine a lot but actually they have some sort of hidden hidden agenda um so yeah in terms of making the attack pragmatic it's really good if you can simultaneously buy the mining rigs all the supporting infrastructure in terms of cooling and and uh, and transformers and the access to the power right because getting gigawatts of power is not always you know that that trivial and you could even you know just acquire the know-how right and some even some of the people who are who are running these the, the, these infrastructures and there could be a training program right where like even if the people who work within these these companies are very ideologically minded there might be a period of i don't know three to six months where there's a, a knowledge sharing program uh, to to the attacker and now the attacker doesn't need these ideological employees anymore yeah it's certainly like a, an interesting angle on the whole thing um justin i want to thank you for your time uh, this has been a really interesting show and i am excited to get some feedback from it from our listeners and just from the bitcoin and crypto community writ large and hopefully we can have you on again once we get some of that feedback uh but thank you again for your time today thank you will <laughs>